The world of Runeterra is massive, and its history is just as large. In this series, I am going to help you learn about its entire history, from the beginning when there was nothing, to modern day. So buckle in, hit that subscribe button, and let's get right into it. In the beginning, there was nothing. Time, space, even reality as we know it today did not exist. There was only the vast emptiness known as the Void. This void was the home to a group of entities, having no form or sentience, known as the Watchers. In time, this vast and silent emptiness would spark its own creation, reality. And with this reality, an endless and seemingly infinite multiverse. This multiverse included the main, prime universe of Runeterra. With this initial spark of creation came the very first sentient beings, known as the Celestials. These powerful, enigmatic beings would live in the empty, vast space around them, some taking on the form of powerful beings or dragons, while others choosing to remain completely formless, sometimes utilizing a vessel. One of these Celestials that took on the form of a dragon would be known as Aurelian's soul. Aurelian's soul chose to populate the emptiness around him, filling it with stars and forging entire universes. This reality, now containing stars, worlds, and even sound, began to expand into the nothingness of the void. This upset the previously eternal slumbering watchers as they were awoken by all the activity around them. The Watchers became greatly annoyed by all the activity coming from the newly formed multiverse that brought them out of their non-existence. It was at this point the Watchers decided to begin planning a way to invade and eventually completely destroy the Celestials and all reality with them. At some point later, a beautiful and life-giving planet known as Runeterra was formed using world runes. This planet orbited one of the stars created by Aurelian Soul. It also had two of its own moons, one that would inhabit the physical realm and one that would orbit in the spiritual realm. As the world of Runeterra was forged, along with its creation came two separate realms. The physical realm, which would home the material manifestation of Runeterra, along with all of the elemental magic, and eventually all the mortal races that would inhabit it and the spirit realm, which is a spiritual parallel existence where time and space would be obscured and would be the source of all spiritual magic on Runeterra. During these early years of Runeterra's existence, some of the earliest forms of life would begin to appear within this spirit realm, these being the various forms of primordial spirits. The primordials consisted of the primordial spirit gods, whom would govern over concepts such as life and death. Primordial demons, a race of spirits that have no inherent form, whom malign and manipulate their victims to sate their own desires for suffering. And lastly, the primordial yordles, whom would establish the primitive Bandal city around the Bandalwood tree and begin constructing a gateway system that would connect the spiritual and physical realm through an intricate system of portals. As the first signs of flora and fauna appeared in the physical realm of Runeterra, such terrestrial dragons, the contemporary continents, and isles began to form on the planet's surface, like the Blessed Isles. After many years, the first civilizations would begin to form deep under the planet's oceans in the Guardian Sea. Many more civilizations would begin to arrive after this point, and with them, creating many technologies, factions, and even wars. Some time after the initial sapient marine species started to pop up in the Guardian Sea, a new civilization of demigods would come to be in the northern frozen lands. These demigods would begin to terraform the land known as Vorajard. Most of our understanding about the demigods comes from myths, fables, and legends passed down through many generations. Though the validity of these tales is up for debate, it's still no doubt that the demigods had a major hand in the formation of the land that would soon become known as the Freljord. 
many thousands of years later, new mortal species would begin to pop up all over the lands of Runeterra. Trolls, minotaurs, yetis, and most notably for the future of Runeterra, the humans. The humans would gather into many settlements and tribes, creating a vast network of civilizations that would cover the lands of Runeterra. These humans would quickly become the most common and widespread of the many races found on Runeterra, settling in nearly every corner of the world. Some of the first kingdoms would begin to arise at this time. The humans of ancient Ionia, known as the First Lands at this time, would begin to adapt their environment and live harmoniously with the spirit realm. It was around this time that many of the spirit yordles would begin to live openly with the various mortal civilizations. The humans that settled in the northern lands of Vorijard would gather into various tribes and begin worshipping the Freljordian demigods that shaped the lands. On an unknown continent in the eastern hemisphere of Runeterra, another group of humans began to settle, some of which would eventually become the ancient and now lost kingdom of Camavor. As the many mortal civilizations began to settle into their respecting lands of Runeterra, the many kingdoms under the sea would begin to disappear. Not much is known about what exactly caused this disappearance. Some say a rising amount of predators in the sea, or even a migration to the land masses, may have caused their rapture. That said, there are many scattered ruins along the ocean floor that can still be found in the seas today for those brave enough to explore them. The humans of the First Lands would soon find themselves facing a threat that they could never have expected. Across the island continent, now known as Ionia, a great war raged between the mortals and a race of giants that came down from the sky. To defend themselves against these titans, the ever so enlightened mortals of Ionia took the power of the spirit realm into themselves and became the first, Vastaya Shirai. The powers they gained from tapping into the spirit realm granted them near immortality, potent shape-shifting powers, and the ability to use the natural world as a weapon in order to fight the ever-encroaching titans. After this intense, lengthy, and grueling battles known as the Titan War, the Vastaya Shirai would find themselves victorious, many of them becoming known as great war heroes. The remains of this war are found across Ionia in the form of mysterious, ancient ruins and battlefields. These come in the form of giant weapons left behind and statuesque ruins that potentially resemble, or even are, the remains of these giants. The Vastaya Shirai eventually decided to live among their mortal kin, crossbreeding as their less magical descendants would eventually be known as the more common. Vestaya. These Vestaya would gather into tribes and cultural identities named after their Vestaya Shirai ancestors, with some of them migrating to lands outside of Ionia. While the Ionians fought their war in the island continents of Ionia, a group of humans known as the Hearthblood began to settle in the northern lands of the Freljord, dedicating their lives to crafting various weapons, tools, and other objects as worship to Orn, the Freljordian demigod of forging and craftsmanship, whom they considered their patron with the goal of reaching his idea of perfection. It was during this time that three Freljordian sisters were born. Born into a world of wilder magic, the three dedicated their lives to search for a way to control the powerful, magical forces of the world. Cyrilda attempted to command the heavens above them, but lost her voice to the first twilight. Avarosa faced the twisting dark beneath the world and was deafened by its emptiness. Not long after, Lysandra struck a deal with the Watchers to help conquer the Freljord from the demigods in exchange for entrance into Runeterra, the sisters would unite their armies and defeat the old gods of the north. Shortly after the defeat of the demigods, the sisters would begin discussing their arrangement with the Watchers. Cyrilda and Avarosa 
deeming their servitude as a fate far worse than death itself. Not only were they in debt to the Watchers, but as time went on, the Freljard would become even more inhospitable. The winds would grow colder and the sky began to darken. As the Freljord became more inhospitable, the sisters would separate and the mortal Iceborne tribes, who had once fought side by side to defeat the demigods, would now begin warring with each other. As the wars raged on, Cyrilda and Alvarosa would gather both of their armies to march on Lysandra's army, bunkered away in the Frostguard Citadel to resist serving the Watchers that Lysandra had pledged them to. Cyrilda and Avarosa's armies would begin sieging the Frostguard Citadel, eventually meeting Lysandra and her armies upon the bridge that towered over the Howling Abyss. As the armies began to clash upon the bridge, the sky would grow dark. A frostbitten wind gusted across the bridge. The Watchers began to materialize across the Freljord and Howling Abyss, causing complete chaos across the lands as these horrific, eldritch horrors finally began reaching into the physical realm. Watching the horrors manifest before her, Lysandra began to realize the magnitude of the mistake she had made by striking a deal with the Watchers. In an attempt to protect the land of the Freljord and Runeterra as a whole, Lysandra, in a last-ditch effort, did the unthinkable to stop the Watchers from fully materializing. Sacrificing her sisters and all their armies gathered within the Howling Abyss, she enacted a ritual to entomb the Watchers in true ice, succeeding in, in imprisoning them halfway between the Void and the physical realm. Having successfully trapped the Watchers, Lysandra and her armies would attempt to remove the history of the Frozen Watchers from the world, though the true ice that would defend the Freljord from the Void would only be a temporary solution. Lysandra would remain in power, secretly, even up until modern day. Many thousands of years after the War of the Three Sisters, movement would start to occur in the most distant eastern islands of Runeterra, bringing all their ancient knowledge and wisdom with them. Settlers from the forgotten lands of the distant east would begin reaching the shores of Shirima and Valoran. This dispersion of mortal humans from the ancient homelands would start the creation of some of the greatest civilizations Runeterra has ever known. A group of humans called the Buru would settle in the Serpent Isles, worshipping and eventually managing to utilize the power of the immensely powerful spirit god of the ocean, Nagaka Burus. An enlightened society of educated scholars and philosophers whom dedicated themselves to discovering the mysteries of Runeterra would form on the Blessed Isles after encountering the nature spirit Maokai who gifted them with the location of the blessed waters of life due to their respect for the lands and its magic. Ishokan would be built as the capital city of Ishtal in the Shariman jungle, a hub for those dedicating their lives to mastering elemental magic. In the western deserts, the great nation of Shirima would be founded, eventually leading themselves into a golden age. Even further west, mortals would discover the great Mount Targon. Here, they would create a tribal theocracy centered around the celestial powers that created the mountain, eventually tricking our friend Aurelian's soul into servitude. Not too long after the founding of Shirima, a seaport named Osha Vazan would open, connecting the northern continent of Valoran and its southern sister continent, Shirima. On the southern peninsula of Shirima, under a mage king, the rebellious mageocracy of Akathia would form. This resettling of mortal humans across the lands would stir up many advancements in technologies and magics, as well as trade between the far east, north, and southern regions of Runeterra. At the time of the migration, these new settlers were oftentimes far more advanced magically than those of the first lands of the Freljord causing future conflicts and even destruction. As the many new nations began to settle in their respecting corners of Runeterra, one nation developing its magics through the assistance of the aspects themselves would reach a level of near godlike power 
that would endure for millennia to come. As the Sun Empire rose to prominence, the old city of Naramazeth would be the capital of Shirima. It was here that the Sun Worshippers made the first iteration of a Sun Disc. Guided by the divine aspects of Targon, in preparation for some unknown future war, these ancient Shurimans would use the Sun Disc to undergo a transformative ritual giving them extraordinary power and a long life so they could safeguard their nation and its interests. These noble ascended, also known as Sunborn, were worshipped as living gods and would help to form the great Shuriman Empire. The warrior queen Sataka would become one of the very first ascended, wielding the gifted Kalakar, a weapon brought from beyond the mountain and raised aloft at Shurima's birth. It was said that entire war campaigns could be won the moment a god warrior took to the battlefield because their foes chose to turn and flee rather than face them directly. These Ascended would lead the Great Empire into a millennia of strength and growth. The Ascension ritual would usually be decided upon by the Sun Priests through criteria that are mystical and governed by ritual and superstition. And usually, it's granted to those who have selflessly served Shurima and are being given the chance to do so even after what would normally be their time to die. The process of Ascension, though, was not a perfect science. While sometimes the Ascension would raise strong, near-perfect God Warriors, other times it could fail altogether, killing the host. Usually, it'd be somewhere in between. After one failed Ascension, the Sun Disk of Naramazif would be destroyed. The Shurimans, not being a culture to give up easily, would build a larger and more powerful Sun Disk in the current Shuriman capital, likely with the help of Ishtali mages. After its construction, an oasis would appear inside of the structure. Its life-giving water would pour into the surrounding area, giving life to the desert, later on creating a large and sprawling river system named the Mother of Life River. It was around this time that Shurima would name its first emperor, and the empire would end up absorbing a great deal of nations and cities as vassal states, some of these including Ishtal and Osha Bazan. Eventually, the Shuriman Emperor would set his eyes to the south and the great nation of Akathia. Despite the Mage King's call for a peaceful coexistence, Akathia would eventually be subjugated by the Shuriman Empire and their ascended. After conquering Akathia, the Shuriman Empire would begin abolishing of worship of other deities other than their own ascended, marking the others as false idols. Hundreds of years later, the Council of Akathia would submit countless petitions to the Shuriman Emperor, asking for some of its own most notable and noble citizens to be granted the gift of ascension and gaining the vassal state of Akathia, some say in the Empire that had consumed them years before. All of these petitions would be denied or ignored. Hostilities and anger towards Shurima would grow with each failed petition, often denied without any explanation. The Akathian leadership would in turn attempt to seek independence from the Shuriman Empire, seeking allies in Ishtal and other neighboring states. All fearing the power of Shurima and its ascended would decline such an alliance. Being pushed into a corner by the tight grip of the Shuriman Empire, Akathia would make a desperate attempt to secede. Not long after a large earthquake hit the lands of Akathia, a group of mages would find an unearthed void rift. These mages would seek to utilize this discovery in Akathia's push for independence, voting to weaponize it against their oppressors. The Council of Akathia, as a message of independence from the Shreeman Empire, would crown a new Mage King and re-establish the Kahari Order, the Mage King's personal guard. Loyal citizens of Shreeman would either be killed or banished from Akathia. Akathian citizens would loot and pillage Shreeman homes and settlements within Akathian territories. In a response to this uprising, the Shuriman Emperor was sending a group of Shuriman Ascended, possibly led by Sataka herself. A massive Shuriman army would find itself at Akathia's door. In an attempt to use the Void Rift against their adversaries, the Council of Akathia accidentally opened an even larger Void Rift, causing countless Voidborn to seep into the physical realm and ultimately tainting the land itself. A massive battle between the Voidborn and the Ascended would ensue. Some of these Ascended would even die in battle, such as Sataka. 
Nazuk, a god warrior of Ishtal, went to the Shreeman Emperor and pledged to create a weapon that would be powerful enough to stop the void, eventually creating a floating fortress of living stone maintained by the greatest mages and Ishtali god warriors. Bringing the super weapon to Akathia, they would fight the void. After weeks of endless battles, the giant monolith would eventually fall, much of the fortress being lost into the gaping maw that had been created, vanishing into a silent nothingness below. Wishing to preserve their nation from losing any more to the growing threat of the void, Ishtal mages would throw the wilderness around them like a shield, isolating Ishoakon from the rest of the world. In a desperate attempt to stop the void, the Netherblade would be created and wielded by Horak, an ascended warrior who would then delve deep into the underground void tunnels, attacking the rifts at their core and eventually turning the tide of the battle. Shabaka and Shabak, ascended twins with the heads of ravens, would eventually help seal the Great Rift of Akathia, ultimately halting the spread of the void. Having halted the spread of the void and losing its allies in Ishtal, the Shreeman Empire would attempt to rebuild and ultimately fall after the Great Void War. Still recovering from the Void War, Sharima would lay siege to the city of Nashrame. With Nasus and Renekton at the helm, Renekton would lose himself during the battle and nearly burn the whole city to the ground, Nasus eventually stopping him. During an assassination attempt, all the sons of the current Emperor of Sharima would be killed, all but one, the Emperor's least favorite, Azir. Zerath, a man born as a nameless slave would protect him and ultimately save his life. Azir, being eternally grateful, would promise Zerath that he would free him and all the other slaves once he became emperor. Now, next in line to the throne, Azir was only a heartbeat away from fulfilling his promise. Years would pass. Zerath would take dark steps to ensure the emperor would not have another son to take Azir's place as the Emperor did not favor Azir. Using nascent magical abilities, Zerath would corrupt every infant that would enter the Emperor's wife's womb, causing them all to be stillborn. Despite Zerath's best efforts to thwart the Queen's midwives, a new Prince of Sharima was brought into the world. But on the night of his birth, Zerath used his growing magical powers to summon the elemental spirits of the deep desert and craft a terrible storm ultimately killing the queen. The emperor, being present, forced Zerath to kill him as well. With Azir now on the throne, Zerath would then expect freedom of himself and the other slaves. However, Azir instead would focus on making Shreem an even more expansive empire and deflect any of Zerath's mentions about it. Zerath would then decide to steal the throne from Azir as revenge. However, in secret, Azir began to formulate his plan on how to free all of the slaves. Azir announced he would undertake the Ascension Ritual, that he had earned the right to stand alongside Nasus and Renekton as an ascended being. The Sun Priest protested, but such was Azir's hubris that he ordered them to comply on pain of torture and death. The day of Ascension arrived and Azir marched towards the Dais of Ascension. With Zerath at his side, Azir stood beneath the sun disk and in the final moment before the priest began the ritual, events took a turn Zerath had not anticipated. The Emperor turned to Zerath and told him that he was now a free man. He and all of Sharima's slaves were now released from their bonds of servitude. The Emperor's words pierced the bitterness enclosing Zerath's heart, but it had come too late as Zerath's plans were already in motion. With a roar of anger and grief combined, Zareth blasted Azir from his place on the dais, watching through tears as his former friend burned to ash. Zareth took Azir's place, and the light of the sun filled him, reshaping his flesh into that of an ascended being. But the power of the ritual was not his to take, and the consequences of his betrayal of Azir were devastating. The unbound power of the sun all but destroyed Shreema, sundering its temples and bringing ruination upon the city. 
Azir's people were consumed in a terrifying conflagration as the desert rose up to claim the city. The sun disk fell, and an empire built by generations of emperors was undone in a single day. The sun disk and the Shuriman capital, now with no power left in them, would sink beneath the sands to be lost in time with the powerful empire that was once Shurima. The ascended god warriors would control Runeterra for centuries of uneasy alliance. Having no emperor to lead them, many would attempt more insidious ambitions. Viewing themselves the rightful inheritors of the world, they would enslave many of the mortal races and force them to worship them. Bereft of purpose and scarred by what they had endured facing the void many of the Ascended became twisted in body and mind, naming themselves Darken and raising hordes of mortal warriors to conquer the world. The Darken mastered many forbidden forms of primal magic, crafting their own flesh and armor with equal ease until they were completely unrecognized as the noble warriors they had once been. With no purpose, these Darken would begin to clash with each other. Eventually, the aspects who had inspired their creation in the first place were forced to intervene, imprisoning the Darken within their own accursed weapons. The last Darken, Varus, would be defeated and sealed away within his magical bow by Vestian Moonstalkers and human mages in service of a golden armored warrior queen, finally ending the Great Darken War. With the Darken dealt with for the time being, the lands of Runeterra were open to another power to come in and take hold. Many lifetimes ago, a fierce warlord named San Uzal rampaged across the northern wildlands. Driven by dark faith, he crushed every tribe and settlement in his path, forging an empire in blood and death. As his mortal life neared its end, he took great satisfaction in knowing it doubtlessly earned a seat at the God's table in the glorious Hall of Bones for all eternity. Yet when he died, he found no halls or glory awaiting for him on the other side. He grew increasingly bored of the afterlife, and soon, after the Darken had been locked away, he began to call out beyond the veil, tempting those who may help him with endless strength. Eventually, a coven of sorcerers would agree to bring him back to life. He urged them to make him stronger than any mortal as he was lacking any flesh or bone. They bound his spirit form into dark metal plates wrought in the likeness of his old armor. The sorcerers had hoped to use him to fight in their own petty wars, but San Uzal had different plans. Being raised as Mordekaiser, he slew the sorcerers where they stood their armor and weapons showing to be completely useless against him. With his soul being completely restored in his new armor, Mordekaiser would begin his crusade across the lands, forming a new, more powerful empire and constructing the immortal Bastion in the Northeast. During his conquest, Mordekaiser crushed and enslaved all who would oppose his rule, conquering much of the land. At the height of Mordekaiser's dark reign, it was said that a mythic and bloodthirsty fiends haunted the coastal cliffs of eastern Valori, demanding young lives and savage worship from the local tribes. One day, a pale sorceress would approach the barbarian god Mordecai's with an off. The two would then feast together as equals, weaving magic so dark that it is said the wine on their tables would sour and the vibrant red roses in the hall would wither to black. This encounter would later serve as the basis for a secret underground Noxite society with the pale sorceress as its matron. Mordekaiser would eventually be defeated after being betrayed by the same pale sorceress now part of his inner circle. A hidden cabal would manage to sever the anchors that sealed his soul within his army. Eventually, hiding his empty iron armor away and placing his soul in the Hall of Bones, where they would amass power for centuries to come. Half a century after the fall of Mordekaiser, a new change to the geography of Runeterra was about to occur in the southeastern islands known as the Blessed Isles. 
Shortly after the death of the King of Camavor, his brother, Viego, would take up the throne and become the new king. Soon after his coronation, he would fall madly in love with a humble seamstress. Viego and the seamstress would have a whirlwind romance and quickly wed. Unable to focus on governing his country, he would focus on pleasing his new wife, fulfilling her every whim. Viego's enemies would begin to plot in secret due to his questionable leadership. His enemies would hire an assassin to snuff out the young king's life and nearly succeed if not for the speed of his general Callista. However, in saving his life, the assassin's blade, tipped with poison, would instead come into contact with the queen, dooming her to a certain death. Viego would search high and low for a cure, summoning the most profound scholars and doctors from across the land, none of them having a cure for his queen. Viego, becoming desperate, would send Callista off to search for a cure, having his new guard, Akaram, replace her in her leave, eventually sailing to the Blessed Isles, where she had heard of the long lost waters of life. The island's inhabitants accepted Callista's request and asked her to bring the queen to the island, where they would cleanse her. However, they made her promise not to reveal the secrets of the island to others. While she was away, Viego would descend into madness, locking himself away in a tower with his queen until she would eventually die. Being unable to lead the kingdom, it would fall into chaos, many protesting his reign. The king would then order Hecarim to squash any and all insurrection in the kingdom. It was around this time that Callista would return from her journey to find she was too late and the queen had already passed. Viego would ask her what she had found, but knowing she was too late and seeing the mental state of the king, she refused to reveal what she had discovered. She would then be named a traitor. Hakaram would later find out she had planned to take them to the Blessed Isles. With this knowledge, Viego would set sail for the Blessed Isles with his armies eventually asking the island's guardians to resurrect his queen. The guardians would refuse, sending Viego into a rage. He would order Callista to destroy the city Helia, to which she would refuse. Hakaram would then betray her, stabbing her with a spear and killing the soldiers loyal to her. Hakaram would then move to pillage and destroy the city. Viego would be guided to the waters by a custodian, who would later be known as Thresh, eventually lowering the queen into its healing waters. The ritual would only be half successful in bringing the queen back to life, but as a horrifying wraith. The queen, being confused and filled with anger and pain from being ripped from death, she would take Viego's enchanted blade and lunge it through his heart. They would both fall and sink beneath the healing waters. The magic of the healing waters and the enchanted sword would clash, transforming the area around into a black mist. The magical energy would erupt, tearing across the land, corrupting the island and all of its inhabitants. Hecarim and his knights would attempt to flee, but were caught in the shockwave, fusing the riders and their steeds, transforming them into spectral riders. Shattering the barrier between the material and the spiritual realms, the souls of the dead would be trapped in eternal torment with the coiling black mist. The blessed isles being forever lost within the black mist would now and forever be known as the Shadow Isles, being completely abandoned by all right-thinking mortals. With Helia lost and the Blessed Isles being transformed into the Shadow Isles, the ancient order that was trusted with the responsibility of gathering and protecting Runeterra's most dangerous artifacts would be left in shambles. Struggling to keep the knowledge of these world ruins hidden, political tension would follow 
the now vast developing nations would grow unwilling to trust one another with these runes for fear of being destroyed with them by their rivals. These nations would grow increasingly fearful of each other over time, and a short period of calmness, for fear of mutually assured destruction, would only last a little over a decade. In spite of the Order's best efforts, knowledge of the runes began to spread. Few could even begin to understand their importance or the sheer power held within them, and yet all saw them as weapons that could be turned against their rivals. Rise and Tyrus, two members of this ancient order, traveled between the various peoples of Valoran, trying to quell paranoia and encourage restraint. But over time, their missions became increasingly precarious, and Rise could sense his master's growing desperation. Finally, in the territories where Rise was born, the first cataclysmic blow was struck in what would eventually be known as the Rumors. Two nations with whom tensions had ran high and were at the brink of destroying each other would be asked by Tyrus to parlay in the village of Kong. After arriving, Tyrus and Rise would realize that it was far too late and the conflict had gotten beyond their abilities to mediate. Rise and Tyrus would run to the hills and bear witness to the destructive powers of these runes. The earth would fall away beneath the village the bedrock itself seeming to retch and squeal, while the sky above them would recoil as if it was mortally wounded. Rise and Tyrus would look back to where the two rival armies had once stood, seeing destruction on a scale so massive that it defied all physical sense. Buildings, farms, and people were all gone. The ocean that was once a day's journey off in the distance now rushed to meet them. Rise fell to his knees, staring at the great hole torn into the earth. Nothing left of the village he had once called home. Open warfare soon raged across Runeterra. Rise felt compelled to join the conflict, to pick a side and lend his magical strength to the cause. But Tyrus stayed his hand. The two of them had to guide others back towards peace and pray there was anything left of the world by the time it was all over. As time passed and the conflict spread, Rise noticed his master growing more distant. Eventually, Rise decided to confront him, and to his horror, discovered that Tyrus had secretly come into possession of not only one, but two of the runes. The allure of the runes had left its mark upon him, where once he desired only peace, now he had the means to bring about the end of all things. Rise had to act even if it meant destroying his only true friend and ally in the room. In an instant, he unleashed all the magic he could muster. A moment later, Tyrus's corpse lay smoldering on the floor. Soon, the greatest civilizations all but destroyed one another, ending the war. Rise now understood the task he had inherited. As long as any world room remained unsecured, Runeterra was surely doomed. This knowledge was to become a lonely burden indeed, for ever since that day he has scoured the world in search of the last remaining runes. He continues to reject the promise of power within each one, choosing instead to bind them in secret locations, far from prying and greedy eyes. Refugees of the Rune Wars would find a land with magic nullifying petrocyte and settle there eventually becoming the great nation of Demacia. From the ashes of the Rune Wars, many other great nations would rise. In the northeast, the Noxi tribes being forced to retreat into the immortal bastion by the magical fallout would eventually emerge as the unified nation of Noxus, making this emergence as year zero on the standard and most commonly used calendar in Runeterra. Noxus, growing ever ambitious, would swear to unite all of the nations of Runeterra under a single flag, sometimes forcefully. Far to the west, the nation of Demacia would crown its first king, Orlum. Settling in magic nullifying petrocyte, Demacia would be a sanctuary far away from the magics that had all but destroyed the world in the Rune Wars. Merchant clans controlling the trade routes between Valoran and Shirima would finalize plans to destroy the land connecting the two continents, 
allowing safe sea passage between the continents. Using thousands of Chemtech bombs to create the passage, the results would be catastrophic. The bombs would trigger a series of earthquakes, tragically singeing large districts of Zan and its citizens into the poisonous gases. Janna, a Shariman spirit goddess, would hear the prayers of the Zanites and arrive to blow away much of the poisonous gases and save many thousands of people. Eventually, Zan would be rebuilt. Regulating the newfound oceanic passageways would bring great wealth and likely led to the construction of Piltover, built over top of the sunken Zon. Progress Day would be celebrated as the anniversary of the opening of these gates. Immigrants and refugees from Demacia, Freljord, and Ionia would travel and settle in the Serpent Isles. The Buru would allow these settlers to settle in the southern bays. This settlement would eventually grow into the bustling port city of Bilgewater. Many wars would be fought from these developing nations and bring us into modern day Runeterra. Whether it was Noxus conquest being halted by Demacia, or Piltover making giant scientific advancements bringing us into the modern age, Runeterra would grow and become the world that we know it is today. Many hundreds if not thousands of champions would rise and fall over the next hundred years. From the great northern Valoran peaks of the Freljord to the southern Shariman deserts, all the way to the eastern islands. The world of Runeterra is truly a massive world and spectacle to explore. Thank you for coming along with me on this wild ride as we explore the history of Runeterra. I plan on making future more in-depth videos about different moments in the lore how they may affect the future of the Riot MMO, and what we can expect when playing the game. If you enjoyed any of this content, or you even made it this far and you're not subscribed yet, just hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, like the video, and as always, my name is Spun, and I will see you in the next videos. Peace.